Keep your Bibles open at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Have an exhortation from the Word of God. Two words. Don't faint. Or three words. Don't be a coward. Why? Because we have received ministry. But it's fainting territory. <laughs> lots of reasons, lots of things, lots of things that go on that entice us to grow weary, to quit, to faint. Father, we ask for the ministry of the Spirit of God upon us today that we would hear the word of the Lord, that we would be encouraged in the ways of the Lord, that would be instructed in the sure path that will keep us from fainting. And for this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever had a spiritual fainting fit? You're going along, you face temptation, you face trial, you face trouble, and before you know it, you're out of gas. You're ready to quit. It's too hard. It's too difficult. Others have quit, so I will. The message of these verses is don't quit, regardless of the circumstances. And we must not yield to fainting, quitting, because we have a ministry. We have a grand ministry and many resources. And, and God has done this wonderful thing where he has metamorphosed us. He's changed us, transformed us into new creatures in Christ. For more instruction as to the ministry we have received, you turn over one page to chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians, read verse 17 through 20. Therefore, if any man or any woman be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given to us, what? The ministry of reconciliation. If there's one thing that should mark your life and mine as a Christian, is that we are rejoicing in being reconciled to God. The, the war is over. Uh, we've laid down our weapons. He's forgiven us of our sins. Uh, we're no longer in the camp of the enemy. We're in the camp of the King of Kings. And we have this ministry of reconciliation. You may have troubles and trials, but one thing that should mark the Christian is we have an ability a motivation to be reconciled, to be a reconciler. And so he says, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. That doesn't mean reconciling the entire human race, there'll be nobody in hell. No. Every, every verse in scripture tells you that not all will be saved. The wonder is not that there will be people in hell. The wonder is that there will be anybody in heaven. For all are under the wrath of God and all deserve the wrath of God. Just like every... Have you ever asked yourself this question? Why did God not give one ounce of mercy to the fallen angels? Number two, does that put a a cloud on God's character? You see, for many people it does because in our world, God is love. That settles it. That's it. John 3.16, that's the only verse in the Bible. Forget the context of John 3.16. Forget the whole rest of the Bible. God is love. 
And so God ought to save everybody. He's not obligated to save anybody. The mystery, the wonder, is the mercy and grace of God. And ultimately, he will save a numberless multitude out of every kindred, tribe, and people. And he's committed to us the word of reconciliation. Verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ. Suppose, regardless of who the president is, uh, let's bring it on to the next election, and a new president oftentimes has a flurry of ambassadors to appoint uh, to various countries. And frankly, in our culture, it's, it's a political payoff. But regardless, if you are appointed as an ambassador, pick the country, it doesn't matter. When you go to that country, you're there to represent that country's interests. No. There to represent not even your own interest, but the interest of America. You're an ambassador. Well, we're living in a foreign country. You say, well, we're close to July 4th, and I'm, I'm a citizen of America. I understand that, but you have dual citizenship, and one is stronger than the other. They're not even close. You're in the family of God. You're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You belong to him. We're here to represent his work and his ministry. We have an ambassadorship. Now, one of the things that causes us to have spiritual fainting fits is we don't know who we are while we're here. And if we don't know who we are and why we're here and we act like we don't know who we are and why we're here, we just flounder around. And if a trial or a testing comes, we just fall flat on our face. If we know who we are and why we're here, we position ourselves, we ready ourselves to function with strength and might and consistency to represent the interest, the, the interest to which we've been assigned. The, apost the, the uh, apostleship or the uh, ambassadorship in the kingdom of God. So he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God unto him. So let us not be fainting. We have a, we have a great ministry. We're a new creation. The old has passed away. He's reconciled us to himself. We're ambassadors. Back in our text passage in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6, we have received light. And life, he's shined in our hearts for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is something that is important to the child of God. We want to experience and manifest the illumination of God in our lives. We're no longer in darkness, we're in light. God has shined in our hearts and he has flooded us with his resources. We don't need to faint. We don't have to faint. We must not be cowards and we have power. Verse 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Everything about the Christian life speaks of what God has done. And what he's doing. He gives us his mercy. He gives us his light. He gives us his power. We have inward resources. The mercy, the love, the grace of God. There's no reason for us to faint. So why are we fainting? We must not yield to fainting. Notice in verse Two of Second Corinthians 4 but we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully 
but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. The Christian is truth focused, declaring the truth. There's power in the gospel. And so we're not having to come up with something. We have been transformed by that power. And now we have the privilege to speak it, to sow the seed of it. We actually believe that there is power in the word of God. And there are a lot of people, thankfully, who believe that. That's why Gideon Bibles are spread all over the world. You say, well, a lot of them get thrown away. They do. And we've, I think from this pulpit, one of the Gideons shared of a particular Gideon Bible that was picked up out of the trash can, been thrown away. The person who picked it up out of the trash can read it and was saved. The, the word of God, according to Hebrews 4, 12, is, and is still this way, it is quick and powerful. It is alive. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and merit, and is a discoverer of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. There's nothing that will expose the real need of my life like the word of God. You can read all kinds of books and get information and you can get all kinds of emotional thrills and all the rest but the word of God deals with reality brings about a spirit of conviction and this is why very often the word of God is closed because we know if we start opening that book God's not going to be pointing at somebody else. He's going to be pointing at me and exposing the need of my heart and giving the revelation and the healing that we need. There's power in the word of God. And we're exhorted here not to use it deceitfully. One of the ways that it's used deceitfully today is the old bait and switch. You've uh, answered an ad. Maybe it's for a car deal or whatever, washer and dryer, whatever, and you get to the place and they have baited you with this great deal and now when you're there they want to talk to you about something else. On the same day I received some years ago uh, information in the mail, an invitation to two different events. And in both events they had these big balloons and these big uh, things that kids can ride on and, you know, balloon kind of thing. They have a name. All kinds of games and fun things and snacks and drinks and uh, it's free. What's wrong with that? Nothing. One of them was inviting me or whoever got the information to come to such and such place and, and bring all the, the papers that you needed shredded. And it's right up front. This is the purpose of this thing. To bring your papers that need to be shredded. We'll shred them for free. And by, while you're here, your kids and whoever, you, you can have a fun time. And you're having hot dogs and all the trimmings. No bait and switch on that. But the other one was an invitation to a church. Like so many churches today, they didn't believe in the power of the gospel or the attractiveness of Jesus. And so you get people to come on the basis of all the fun and games. And oh, by the way, we want to tell you about Jesus. Or sometimes churches will use a hell house in October to scare the hell out of you, theoretically, because they want to introduce you, introduce you to Jesus. Never mind that Jesus said, though one come from the grave, if they will not believe Moses and the prophets, they will not believe this. God elevated his word. 
if you today, or if I today, in any area of my life, if I reject the word of God, I'm in deep weeds. Because there is no hope. There is no solution. When it comes to the word of God, most often I need to let the word of God speak to me. Of course, sin and Satan's method is deceit. The solution is the word of God. And the devil is hard at work, going back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid from them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. So he works to keep the minds and hearts occupied, distracted. He loves to distract us. And he has many ways to try to do it. I've shared this a number of times. I'll probably share it a number of more times. It's a parable from a pastor over in England years ago named Christmas Evans. He wrote this parable about the devil's worst day. Now, if you already have this parable memorized, well, let's just practice on applying it. We'll never get to where we don't need a fresh application of what this parable teaches. So once upon a time, a long time ago, the devil determined to do a mighty amount of business on a certain day. And so he set out to devour whom he might. He does that, doesn't he? So he came to a simple plowboy. And the devil said to himself, I will tempt the plowboy to rob his employer. Off to prison he will be sent. While in prison, he will have bad company. He will learn more evil. He will commit vile crimes. He shall be hung at the gallows, and I shall have him forever. So the evil tempster came to the lad who was about, and he was about to flood his eyes and his ears and his mind with enticing temptations. However, the lad was singing. My God, the spring of all my joys, the life of all my delights, the glory of my brightest days, and the comfort of my nights. Ah, said the devil, I shall have to find someone else. This man, this lad's mind is filled with the blessings and praise of my arch enemy. So later in the day he went and found a cottage And sitting on the porch was a young maiden who was simply knitting. And so the devil said, I will entice her away to the big city and lead her into the ways of folly and sin and shame and she shall perish in an insane asylum and I'll have her soul forever. So he slipped up to the young maiden and began to be ready to whisper temptation in her ear. But as he got close, he heard her singing, Jesus, I love thy charming name. This music of mine, it is music to mine ear. Fain would I sound it out so loud that all earth and heaven would hear. So the old devil slithered away. I should have spent my day with old William, so I know I shall be able to torment him. So at nightfall, nightfall, he came to the village where old Williams lived, and there was a light in the bedroom upstairs. Good. Williams is at home. So he slithered up the stairs, and there Williams lay dying. Good. I'll make him doubt and deny his faith. His faith in my enemy. And he will die in despair. And maybe if he's not really sound in faith, I'll get him for eternity. Even if I can't get him for eternity, I'll torment him now. Friends were gathered and sitting and standing around over Williams. 
They didn't notice that the evil one had come. And just as the evil one was about to spring his doubts and wickedness upon the old fellow, Williams raised up and stretched out his arms and cried out, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Oh, by the way, did you notice that none of these, the lad or the maiden or old Williams, none of them had a spiritual fainting fit, even though they were experiencing direct assault from the enemy. The old devil left howling, told his underlings that it was one of, the, one of the worst days he'd ever had. Oh, the power of the word of God, the power of praising and blessing God. The lad, the maiden, and the old man never even took notice of the temptations of the tempter. And we wonder why we have spiritual fainting fits. And when we have to acknowledge that we don't have the word of God at our mind and heart's fingertips, that temptation or no, the Lord has our heart. No spiritual fainting fits. When we are captive to the word of God, the word of God delivers us from the deceit, the deceptions from our own flesh. And so we don't faint. Look at verse 5 in this text chapter. The text says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sight, for Jesus' sake. We are his servants and servants to one another for Jesus' sake. Is that in my thinking? Is that center stage in my life? Or is my life all consumed with buying and selling and eating and drinking and the stuff of this life that all passes away, some of it uh, to a degree is just part and parcel of being alive, but it's never designed by God to be the focus of our lives. And when it's the focus of our lives, instead of it getting a proper amount or even leftovers, God gets the leftovers and minister to others, not so much. This week, did I place my agenda, my agenda in the backgrounds and front and center stage was being the Lord's servant at work, where I live, or wherever, and even though there's trouble everywhere, trouble on every side, not distressed, perplexed, not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed, always bearing in my body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. All kinds of things are going on and will be going on. They won't lessen. But will they paralyze me? Will they silence me? Will I lie here and fret and worry and stew and, or will I press on? Will I go forward? 
do I give evidence that I've read the last chapter? Not forsaken. Because Jesus is always with me. Troubled. Not distressed. Perplexed. Not despair. All the things that happen to me in a fallen world happen to lost people. They have no resources. We have resources. They don't have anything to keep them from fainting. We do. We must not yield to fainting. Life is short. In the body, we bear the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are delivered to death for Jesus' sake. Death works in you, but life Death works in us, but life in you. We faint not because we have a passion of wanting others to see life. It's not a matter of of going to a school for soul winning. It's a matter of walking with Jesus where you are. Oh, there's nothing wrong with having studies and gaining some specific scripture knowledge. But when in daily life we die to ourselves, we die to hurt, we die to personal ambition, we die to criticism, we die to whatever because we want others to see Christ. One of the ways that you can know and that I can know that I'm on the right track is I'm not thinking about what the other person did or did not do. I'm thinking about my opportunity. I'm not consumed with what they did or did not do. If they're lost, they don't have any resources. Even if they're saved, but for the grace of God, I would do that. God doesn't want me to confess, even in my mind, your faults. If I see your faults, if I'm having to deal with your faults because you just dumped on me, the Lord is giving me an opportunity to manifest him. Much of our witnessing is already set up. The, the assignments have already been given. The, the sun rises and a new day of assignments come. A new day of ministry comes. We must not yield to fainting because set before us, verse 14, is hope that motivates. We faint not knowing that one day we'll be presented by the Lord Jesus when he comes. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. Eternity is looming, and Christ is our shepherd. And we're not going to faint because we're saying, Lord, one of these days, maybe the day, I'll be introduced face to face in your presence. So the temptations come and they come in like a flood. But because you've hid God's word in your heart and you hide God's word in your heart, just like the maiden, just like the lad, just like old Williams, immediately out comes the sword of the spirit, the shield of God by which we squelch all the words of Satan. No, I can't go here. No, I can't do this. 
because I want God to be glorified in my life. That will not glorify God. And so for all these reasons, we think not. So much is at stake. We're committed to Christ. We're committed to his church. We're committed to souls. We're committed for eternity's sake. And because we have a cause to which we are committed, we serve. Oh, that's too close for comfort. I can't be honest and say I'm committed to a cause. Or at least not Christ called. I, I want God to help me when I'm in trouble. But we press, we faint not for eternity's sake. For our light affliction, which is but for the moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So here's a chapter that just lays out before us the exhortation, don't faint. And floods our minds with solid reasons why we shouldn't. There's not a single one of us here. But from time to time, we're dealing with with fainting fits. And if we're honest, it's rooted in our casual approach to the Word of God, to fellowship with Him, to hiding God's Word. Do you remember Jesus said, Without my Father, I can do nothing? Jesus, the man Christ Jesus, who did not cease to be God, became a man, lived as God intended man to live, what was that like? Without my father, I can do nothing. He was utterly dependent upon his father for all things. That was his great secret. And he says to us, without me, John 15, 5, you can do nothing. And so when I'm living with a, with a closed Bible, when I'm living as if I don't really need the body of Christ by which the Spirit of God builds us up through that which every joint supplies, when, I can, when I'm living as if I don't really need what God provides and God ordains, I'm playing the fool. Let's be honest, it's easy to do. There's so many things to distract us. But we're in a war zone. And it's the place where God has ordained that we have ministry. Not a place where we just sulk and hide and cringe in fear but a place where armed with the whole armor of God, suited up in the righteousness of Christ, we go forth, confident that whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Our Father, we spent many days of our lives, various stages of fainting fits, various stages of spiritual doldrums, various stages of toying with being entertained by the world, the flesh, and the devil. We thank you most of all for the example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who not only came and paid our sin debt, but he qualified for it that making that payment because he perfectly served the Father in all things. He was dependent upon his Father with all things, so he did not sin. And he caused us to walk in his steps. 
Yes, we all sin. But we're called to holiness. We're called to purity. We're called to put on the whole armor of God. We're exhorted, don't faint. Have a fresh focus on your ministry. You're, you've been given an ambassadorship. You're called to a ministry of reconciliation in a world of conflict, of all places where there should not be conflict, is Christian homes and Christian churches. Of all places where there not, should not be a playing around with the works of the flesh. And yet in those places it is rampant. Lord, may we by the grace of God go forth embracing the ministry that you've called us to. Reveling in and receiving the benefits of all the weaponry that you have provided for us. May we go forth treasuring the word of God, treasuring one another as to that ministry of building up each other in the faith. We bless you that in the deepening darkness of the hour, it is a grand opportunity not to faint, but to exalt in the Lord Jesus Christ. And for this we pray and give thanks in Jesus' name.